Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science. Australia appears to be flattening the curve of COVID-19 cases, but there are still serious concerns for at-risk communities. Our Indigenous people are vulnerable for many reasons, and remote communities have been severely restricting visitors to prevent the spread of the virus. But the reality is that less than 20% of our Indigenous population live in remote communities. The majority of our Indigenous people live in cities and towns. So what's being done to protect them? Joining me today is Academy Fellow and Epidemiologist, Professor Fiona Stanley, who is an advocate for Indigenous health and founding director of the Telethon Kids Institute in Perth. Welcome, Fiona. Thank you very much, Paul. You've been working to improve health outcomes for Indigenous communities for many years. Why are Indigenous people considered at risk? Well, there are several reasons, actually. Um, and, the, and the first relates to the fact that they are um, a um, high morbidity population. So they have higher rates of illnesses that put them at risk for COVID-19, much more than the general population. And of course, this reflects years of uh, poor environmental circumstances and so on. So the kinds of things that they have, such as chronic respiratory disease, end-stage renal failure, heart disease and so on, many in remote communities also have had poor nutrition and, um, and, a, and a, therefore a, an immune system that may be uh, somewhat more deficient than, than others. But combining that with um, the infectious disease load they have and the chronic disease, they're, they're, they're much higher risk just because of all those morbidities. The other reason is, of course, that they uh, uh, live in overcrowded conditions. They're highly mobile um, and so uh, coupled with perhaps lack of hygiene. Some of the Aboriginal communities, you know, still don't have uh, a regular supply of fresh water. I mean, this is very much a reflection of our neglect over many years. And of course, the other thing is they don't have always good access to the best care. And that's just not clinical care. It's care for things like the housing, uh, access to water, um, social services and so on. Are there any cases of COVID-19 that we're, we know of in remote Aboriginal communities at the moment? And, and how would those communities cope if there was an outbreak? At the moment, there are probably over 40 cases. I think that's the latest data I got. 40 cases of Aboriginal people that have been identified and all of them are either in cities or urban centres. The reason why um, it would just be a, a, a devastating effect in a remote community is for all the reasons I've already outlined, but it's also very difficult to socially isolate. The other reason why in remote communities they were likely to die more is there aren't any respirators out there, no intensive care, it's a long way. And to actually take someone by Royal Flying Doctor Service from a remote community to a centre when they're very, very ill maybe a death sentence. So I think it would be t devastating. And the people who would die are the people who they want not to die most, the elders, the older ones with the morbidities and so on. Now, I mean, some of the action that has been taken already are things like the government using the Biosecurity Act to restrict visitors to remote Aboriginal communities. Yes. But you're, the point you're making really is that, that, we need, that we need to listen to these communities <clears throat> and let them take some control over the situation. How can that be done better? I think that was a good response. So it is really important that governments who are putting in, you know, bureaucratic solutions uh, do so in consultation with, with Aboriginal communities. And all the communities are different. That's, that is a, a good point. But I think it was a, a good thing to do. Whenever we do things to Aboriginal people, we have to um, get them engaged because they know the context in which they live much more than we do. Yeah, and um, I really take that point that it has to be um, a two-way conversation and rather than dictating, empowering and, um, and, and offering to help but allowing them to lead, uh, yes. th those communities to lead. What about testing? Um, a, a rapid COVID-19 testing program has been introduced for, the, for rural Indigenous communities. How will this program work and will it help? Oh, I think it'd be terrific because I think the difficulty would be is to, if you've got a, a test and then to send the test off and then have several days because time is of the essence here. Um, so if you've got a rapid test, which you can actually say within an hour or two that that person is positive, then you can really start to quarantine and self-isolate very rapidly. Now, the, the exciting thing about this, I think, from an Aboriginal perspective and an Aboriginal health perspective is 
this means there are going to be jobs for people. You know, Aboriginal health workers are, are available all over the country, many of them underemployed, uh, I think many undervalued, and they're outstanding in many situations. And so you'd actually have a sort of contact tracing workforce of Aboriginal health workers um, in communities, not, not just in the remote, but that's a really good example. And, you know, what might happen as a result of this pandemic is more Aboriginal people um, are trained and, and educated about not just pandemics but health generally, uh, a demonstration that Aboriginal people, when given this uh, training and education and uh, have the capacity to implement it very effectively, it might actually end up that we, that we have a much better uh, ways of working with Aboriginal people than we have in the past. Now, what about the majority of Indigenous people who live in cities and towns around Australia? Um, how do, how can they be better looked after? The gap is there with all of the things that we know we measure for the gap, life expectancy and for mortality and so on. Now, um, so it does reflect quite poorly on the fact that um, these numbers aren't huge. There are probably uh, 850,000 Aboriginal people in Australia. There are about 90,000 Aboriginal people living in Western Australia, and yet we still can't provide services. I mean, it's a, it's it's almost a, a joke if it wasn't so very serious. Um, and uh, so the 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 challenge in, is then uh, to imp to really get the Aboriginal controlled health services who are all around the country. Um, to get together and empower them so that we've got all the capacity to both prevent, monitor and then treat Aboriginal people who may develop COVID-19. If there was a takeaway message of what you'd like to see from um, you know, response to COVID-19 in relation to Indigenous people, you know, this is a, a, a really a once in a generation opportunity to reset, to, to respond in the way that we manage um, health with Indigenous communities, but also manage uh, those relationships. And we've seen what um, having political will to, to introduce telehealth as, as it was almost sort of overnight universally, we can we can make these sorts of changes if we seize the opportunity and 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 do them. What is your takeaway message and what you'd like to see? I think it has exposed our appalling um, inability to actually um, improve Aboriginal health outcomes and other outcomes. We haven't even mentioned mental health, but that's another really really important one. Um, but um, uh, the the exciting thing, as I say, might happen is that we will start to value um, the Aboriginal capacity and boost it up so that um, uh, giving them a voice, and I do think if we can give them a national voice, this is a, this is about the best example I can think of. If we can do this with COVID-19, guys, we can do this forever, you know. Um, so the, the most important thing is to really give Aboriginal people a voice, and I mean power, I mean funding, I mean partnerships that give them the power and we're the sort of people who just help along. I mean, too, for too long, the bureaucrats have got the top paid jobs um, and, and, the, and the money that's meant to have gone to Aboriginal community services has not. And that's in every, it's across the board, health, housing, education, child protection, etc. cetera. Um, but I think, you know, if we can then do this to improve general health, improve housing, improve hygiene, you know, I think, you know, education um, and access to good clinical care. I mean, it ain't rocket science, but it is really, really important. So I think we have a lot to learn if we can take the humility to do so and to give the power to these guys. I, th I think it's actually quite an exciting time if we take the opportunity. We're listening and, and hopefully action will follow. Fiona Stanley, thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you very much, Paul. It's been a pleasure. And a reminder that if you have questions about COVID-19, we probably have the answers. Just visit the special COVID section of our website where you'll find up-to-date videos and articles. I'm Paul Richards. See you soon.